And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's special pop-up edition is titled The Crisis in Ukraine in Historical Context. I'm very pleased to be joined by current fellow Christian A. Raffensperger. He's the Kenneth E. Ray Chair in the Humanities, Professor and Chair of History at Wittenberg University in Ohio. Today is March the 16th, 2022. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President for Education at the Center. And on behalf of my staff, colleagues, Jira and Mike and Meredith, I want to welcome you back to, uh, to what actually is uh, game two of a doubleheader. We just had a a wonderful webinar last night with Elizabeth Altka on the uh, interwar literature of the of the pandemic era. And uh, tonight we have organized uh, very quickly and very um, spontaneously a webinar to provide some what we hope will be uh, longer term historical context of the current crisis in Ukraine. It's so easy as educators and as citizens and as folks who pay attention to the world around us to respond to the headlines and to sort of wake up to those current events. And it's important to be able to describe that to your students and to understand sort of how to consume that real time uh, in the moment uh, series of events. But what humanists and historians understand too is that there is a long view, a context. And it's that context that I think will also be very helpful as you help your students really of any age better understand this, uh, this complicated ser series of global events. As I look around the room tonight, I'm super pleased to see folks from all over the country uh, many different backgrounds. Greg's here from um, from Bloomington, Minnesota. Thanks so much for joining us, Greg. Dina's not so far away from me here in Chapel Hill. Dina's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Sharon's down in Broward County, South Florida. Thomas in New Hampshire. Uh, Dean, I haven't seen you in our webinars before. It's great to have you. You're at the Moody Library in Houston Baptist University. Josh is here from Oregon. Jamie's here from Buffalo. Natalia's here from Houston. Sandra's here from Maryland and D.C. Again, it's really wonderful to see such a wide geographic spread. And that does, of course, include our good friend Myla and Sonia, who both of whom are in Alaska. And it's interesting to see in the chat box how uh, students in Alaska have, uh, have a very different context for trying to understand our current conflicts and escalation with Russia. As always, I like to uh, note some, some, uh, some old friends and colleagues who are here. Brooke uh, is with us from Christopher Newport University. Great to see you, Brooke. And Eric is back. Eric led a wonderful webinar for us about a month ago. Eric Muller, uh, please do check out the recording. I see that Eric is joining us from here in Chapel Hill as well. Always, we have lots of uh, participants from Los Angeles. Imelda, great to see you again. Raul's here from Balboa High School. And Zuli is here from Alexander Science Center School. Uh, please do share all of the uh, potential opportunities and, and activities that we do here at the center with educators at all levels with your colleagues and your networks. I would love to see uh, new faces populate our webinars and extend the conversation that I enjoy having with each of you. As many of you know, the National Humanities Center founded in 1978 is located in Durham, North Carolina. Um, each day we have a set of a cohort of university professionals and professors who have received a fellowship here, a completely unencumbered year to uh, do their good work, to come to this building every single day, to research, to write, to converse with colleagues in, in other fields and in other disciplines. And we really do try to, to leave them uh, as, as much of a loan as we can. We see them in the hallway, we get to know them at lunch, we uh, eavesdrop on their work, we uh, do what we can to support them in any way that we can. But on occasion, uh, something happens outside of our little bubble here that kind of pulls people to the to their doors. I almost imagine it's that um, that, that sort of stereotypical situation where someone yells, is there a doctor in the house? And of course, every door opens up. But in this case, uh, it's uh, Dr. Raffensperger, who uh, has found himself with his expertise and authority and background, uh, being able to comment directly on things that are happening outside of our doors and uh, in the headlines of our newspapers uh, on, a, on a regular and hourly basis. I think it's that sense of being able to apply the humanities that is something I'd, I'd like all of you to take away and maybe to emphasize with your students. Uh, the humanities are not these sort of extra disciplines that we do on the side because they're fun and beautiful. Uh, the humanities can really provide a clear context and a clear roadmap for understanding ourselves, our communities, our relationships with others, and the world we live in. And I think tonight is a very uh, good example of how we can directly apply uh, that humanistic pursuit to um, to issues of civic and global concern. All the materials that we share with you are free and open. You can count on that as an educator. 
that does include the resources that have been selected and offered by Professor Raffensperger for tonight's session. Listen, you guys are busy folks. You may not have had a chance to read through or spend time with these resources in advance of the webinar, but I do hope you go back and spend some time with them after the webinar is completed and consider ways that this, uh, these resources can be used in your classroom to extend the conversation we'll have between now and 8.30 uh, East Coast time. Uh, in particular, uh, Christian has pulled together some specific resources, some articles, some primary sources, some chapters that'll be helpful. Here's the advantage. You don't have to go to Google now and find uh, 35 million hits when you search Ukraine crisis. You've got scholarly vetted, uh, authority provided and curated sets of materials that you know you can trust and you can use in your instruction. And I do hope that you find the digital library to be helpful uh, uh, for all of the materials we have available. As you know, at the conclusion of tonight's uh, webinar, you will receive a certificate that earns you five professional development credit hours. I hope that's important for you. I suspect that uh, many of you probably have enough credit hours and you're here to learn more so you become a better teacher. I will remind you though that we only have nine episodes left in our webinar series. Um, we conclude in early May and we will not pick up again until uh, late August of 2022. So uh, please do share this again with your departments and your colleagues, with your networks. We would uh, love to see you uh, revisit our registration page and sign up for any that seem appropriate and relevant and interesting to you. Uh, in particular, uh, the four on the screen uh, provide, again, this kind of longer context for conversations and topics and themes that you likely are discussing on a regular basis with your students. But early May is going to come, and some of you will need professional development credit hours. In that case, I do encourage you to take a look at our online course catalog. We've got one more spring session that's starting next week, and then we have two uh, truncated summer sessions that will offer the same content, the same rigor, but in a condensed week-long format. I do encourage you to take a look at these. It can earn you 35 professional uh, credit hours, and of course, we build in as our design principles the same collegiality and support that I hope that you find in our webinar series. If you're with us tonight, check out that promo code. It's in red. Add that uh, when you register and you can get a discount on the courses that we have uh, to offer. Finally, I want to thank, as I always do, our Teacher Advisory Council. I'm really looking forward to finally meeting this group in person in two weeks when they come to the center for a two-day retreat. This is something, uh, a regular annual occurrence that the pandemic has disrupted as it has many, many things. We are accepting applications for next year's Teacher Advisory Council right now. Go to our website. You can see the eligibility and the application process particularly if you've spent a lot of time with us in these webinars, if you uh, feel like the National Humanities Center is a big part of uh, your instructional toolkit, then I would love for you to be able to uh, work with us more directly to contribute to our work, but also to, to benefit from it. And we really do see this as a mutually beneficial relationship that advances um, humanities education across the country. Finally, uh, let me remind you that tonight's webinar is audio only. Uh, you'll hear our voices, but you won't see our faces. Uh, frankly, it might, be, it might be time to have a little bit of a break from the video feeds that we've all been stuck on for two years. However, that means that the audio is super important. If for some reason uh, you're disrupted, if for some reason you can't hear clearly, there's really two, two solutions that I can offer now. The first is to take a look at that volume button as indicated by red arrow number two. Make sure that your audio is up, make sure that you can hear well. The other thing you can do is simply log out and come back in. That will not disrupt us, and it will not disrupt uh, your record of attendance. Finally, uh, your participation is super important. Please do uh, use the audience chat to chatter with each other, to share thoughts, to uh, brainstorm, to share links. Um, but we'd also like you to submit formal questions. And if you have them, please uh, submit them to using the Ask the Professor tab. They'll come to me as the moderator and I'll bring them to Professor Raffensperger when the time seems appropriate. So again, you have joined a special pop-up version of the Humanity Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Crisis in Ukraine in Historical Context. I'm joined by Christian Raffensperger from Wittenberg University and current National Humanities Center Fellow. I'm also pleased to welcome Judy Freeman as our TA tonight. Judy is a member of our TAC, and Judy will be in the chat box. She'll be offering thoughts and some links of additional instructional resources that she has curated and um, uh, and generally keeping the conversation going. So having said all that, Christian, I'm super glad that you can join us. I, in fact, think you're in the center right now. Hey, Professor, can you hear me over in Research Triangle Park? 
Yeah, I can. I am in the center. And in fact, I'm wearing that same shirt. So that's exactly what I look like. <laughs> well, so that makes me think, though, that uh, for the last two weeks, you've you've been in that kind of strange position as uh, as having the real world reflect what goes on in your head all the time. It must be it must be a little startling in a way to, you know, wake up as you did, as we all did several weeks ago um, and see that that history is happening around us. You know, your uh, analysis earlier where you said, is there a doctor in the house? You know, this yeah. is something that I've thought about for years. And if only somebody would need like <laughs> Ukrainian history or Russian history. Um, and now I guess is the moment. So yeah, February yeah. 24th. Well, and, you know, even before then, I mean, I had a piece in the uh, Columbus Dispatch at the end of, Jul uh, end of January saying this was coming and this is going to happen yeah. um, and we needed to mobilize. But, but um, you know, that was not really the case. And tonight we're going to talk about a little bit why um, some of that happened. Well, before before we get into the, the meat of your talk and your presentation, um, you may have noticed that at the beginning, uh, as we were getting settled and I was playing some Ukrainian top 10 pop music, by the way, and it's also really important, I think, for us to remember that the art and the beauty of Ukraine is still there despite the warfare, right? There's still these these kind of, um, there's humanity that's that's involved here. These aren't faraway things happening to, to other people. But you may have noticed that my question was to our audience, uh, the questions that students are, are having right now. Um, you've probably been doing a lot of interviews, you've been writing, you've been responding to people. What are some of the primary questions you've been getting? What, what do people want to know when they come to a doctor like yourself? The big one is the one I'm going to talk about tonight, which is what does Putin want? Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a big question that everybody keeps asking, and so we're going to spend a lot of time on that right now. The other one, and I get this also you know, from my 13-year-old daughter, so I imagine a lot of you as educators are hearing it too, is will this lead to World War III? Yeah. Um, and so that's a big one. And, and I really don't think it will. Um, the Biden administration and the European Union have been very consistent in saying we're not going to get involved in terms of actual boots on the ground, uh, no no fly zone, that sort of thing. And I think that that is going to prevent any kind of wider involvement. Well, thank you. Thank you for addressing that right up front, because as you probably saw in the audience chat, that is one of the questions on on all of our students' mind and probably all of our minds. And so um, while there's no way to predict the future, it's going to be fascinating for all of us and very, very helpful to, to, to have you kind of lay out this longer view narrative. So, Professor, as we move forward, I'll be collecting questions and we'll pause on occasion when you think the time is right and address them. Uh, I'll give you the reins to the PowerPoint now. And again, thank you for being here. Thanks, Andy, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight. This is really important to talk about some of this history and the context for what's happening. And like Andy was just saying, one of the big questions uh, that everybody keeps asking is, you know, what does Putin want? Um, why is he doing this? And it's a mystery um, in, in terms of asking that question, except it really isn't. Um, it's just a mystery because we're not paying attention to the context. Uh, we don't listen. Uh, Vladimir Putin cares about history. He really genuinely does. He has been saying since 2000 that Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, in 2021, he wrote an essay called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians that laid out from the medieval period to the present about why they are one people and why Ukraine shouldn't exist as a country. This is the rationale for the war. We, of course, um, did not pay very much attention to this, um, in part because you know we have this powerful American folk anthem, uh, history, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. So, um, instead, we get comments like this week in the New York Times, an op-ed uh, by a journalism professor that called Putin's article a boring essay in comparison with Zelensky's stirring speeches. Now, uh, yes, okay, it, maybe it isn't the, the best read, but it does answer the question of what Putin is doing and why. And in fact, it's not just this essay. Uh, when uh, Macron, uh, the French uh, leader, talked to him last week, the readout from the French government said it was a history lesson that Putin offered him. So he really does genuinely care about the history. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight is the history, not about the uh, present conflict, though certainly um, it is all relevant to it. And we're going to add background to all those pieces. 
What I'd like to do is focus on five points of history over the next hour and 15 minutes. Now, those five points are going to be drawn uh, from Putin's essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which I gave uh, as reading, so that's going to be online as well. And in fact, four of the points will be related to his essay, and then uh, a fifth, which is actually my point four on the slide about Holodomor, is not mentioned whatsoever in Putin's material, and we're going to talk about why once we get there. So these are the five points that we're going to spend time on. Um, I'm going to go through each of them one by one, and we'll pause after each or between them to have more questions. So if we can start, uh, I'd like to start back in the medieval period. And if we go all the way back to the 11th century, we can see that there is Kievan Rus. And if you look on your map here, and I apologize, I don't have uh, my, my usual highlighter I would have in the classroom to show you what I was talking about. Um, but on the right part of the slide is Kievan Rus. It is a polity that stretches all the way from Lake Ladiga in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Uh, it stretches from, you can see, um, Vladimir Volinsky uh, in the west, all the way to the Volga River in the east. This is the largest territorial polity in medieval Europe, even though it rarely is discussed in any medieval history classes. Now, this polity was founded by Scandinavians coming from Sweden uh, down through the Eastern European river systems looking for silver, amber, slaves, furs, uh, things that were coming uh, up through the Volga River and Dnieper River and taking them back to trade in the Baltic and throughout Northern Europe. Now, the fact that the Scandinavians are the original Rus is going to be an important element in the foundation of the identity of this medieval polity because they are going to be the uh, eponymous uh, Rus. They're not Slavs. Right? They're something else. They're Scandinavians. Over time, of course, the polity will become a Scandinavian Slavic hybrid and then eventually entirely a Slavic polity. I mention this origin story because this actually is one of the first instances in which Russians of the modern period, now not our period, but about the 18th and 19th century, began to really worry about their history. And they were concerned that having the uh, origin story of Scandinavians coming in and creating a kingdom made them look bad like they couldn't create a kingdom for themselves. And at the time, what was created was an idea that, no, 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 this is a, a medieval myth, uh, that the, the sources from the medieval period are incorrect, and instead it was Slavs who created their own autochthonous state. Now, this is incorrect, but I mention it because there is always or at least often been the idea to write and rewrite history to serve modern or contemporary purposes. Now, I mentioned to you already that this kingdom is one of the largest kingdoms in medieval Europe. It is also a kingdom that is going to be dramatically interconnected with the rest of medieval Europe. I give you this next slide to show you some of that interconnectivity. Now, this is a map showing dynastic marriages, marriages between the ruling elite of the Russian royal family, the royal family of Rus. This is not Russia. Um, this is Rus with people all over medieval Europe. And all of these lines represent a marriage. The thicker the line, sometimes we've got several marriages in there. So as you can see, we have marriages that stretch across the continent. There's a line you can see going to Paris. And this is a marriage from the 11th century in which Henry Capet of the French kingdom is going to marry Anna Yaroslavna, the daughter of the ruler of Kiev, and they will have a son, Philip, who will become the first King Philip. And in fact, the name Philip is introduced into the French royal family by Anna. She is going to not only be queen, uh, she will eventually be regent for her son Philip after her husband dies. And so we will have a Russian woman who is ruling in France in the 11th century. 
The same thing is true in the German Empire, often called the Holy Roman Empire. Later in the 11th century, we'll have a woman, Yevpraxia Vesyevolodovna. I know that's a mouthful. Um, but Yevpraxia will marry into the German Empire, and she will become the empress of that empire, and she will play a major role in a medieval conflict known as the Investiture Controversy. Now, we have no images of either of these women, but Yevpraxia is on this stamp that I have put on the slide here, which is a Ukrainian stamp. They did a whole series of medieval queens. Yevpraxia, Anna, and many others were included, and they created portraits for them as a way of honoring their history, but also as a way of claiming that history of Rus for themselves. And that is an important element in this story as well. The history of Rus, this medieval kingdom, is the history that is at the root of both Ukrainian and Russian history, and lest we forget, Belarusian history as well, because that kingdom will over time become the birthplace of all three of those different modern countries and modern cultures. And so in the medieval period, this kingdom of Rus was one, and it was tied into the larger medieval world. Now, it does change over time. For instance, this map shows you a more in-depth view of what's going on internal to Kievan Rus itself. All of these are separate regions within the kingdom of Rus. And what we're going to see is that Vladimir Suzdal, that's in the top right, the northeast, uh, and Vladimir Volinia, or uh, Vol uh, Volinia and Halic in the bottom left, are going to become the nuclei for different regions of growth over a long durée. They start out in the 12th century as simply part of one kingdom, the kingdom of Rus. But over time, for a variety of reasons, they will move in different directions. They will also then have their own political and international trajectories. So the territory of Vladimir Suzdal will be a territory that becomes more inward looking. It will look more towards the east and to the south, while the territory of uh, Galich Volinia or Halich Volinia, again, we're getting into some Ukrainian versus Russian pronunciation, as you see on the slide with Kiev and Kiev, is going to be more connected with Hungary, Poland, Bohemia, those areas that are to the south and west of Rus. So over the 12th and 13th centuries in particular, we're going to see Rus fracture into multiple independent polities. And that's where we begin to see some of the deep roots of what's going on in the creation of these ideas of what will eventually, not yet, but eventually become uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And so this is just kind of some deep history to show that once upon a time, there was this kingdom that was the core territory from which all three of these modern nation states sprang. And this is essential to understanding what's going to come next, because this keeps getting referenced by Putin and by many others as uh, an attempt the modern day attempt to go back and claim Rus for themselves. And in fact, both modern Ukrainians and modern Russians attempt to claim Rus for themselves. And we're trying to talk about it simply as a medieval polity that exists on its own uh, for its own purposes. All right. So this is my first historical point. Do we have any questions about that that I might be able to answer? We do have a few questions, thank you. And um, again, I'll remind the audience to use the Ask the Professor tab to submit formal questions. And as the moderator, what I'll do is kind of queue them up in order. So Helene, I see your question, but I'm gonna save that for a little bit later. Um, this next question though comes from Earl. Earl is uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And Earl is wondering if um, you can talk at all about the ways that the histories and the cultures and perhaps even the myth mythologies of of what you've just described in this 12th century uh, context, how are these things commemorated today? Or, or you know, you mentioned a, a, you had a stamp. What are some other ways that these stories are shared and told and learned and embedded and and, and sort of kept alive, um, 
you know, eight centuries later? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. And I, I wrote a little bit about this in a piece. Um, honestly, I don't remember where. I think it was in medievalist.net. Um, but Vladimir Putin, very conscious of this history, erected in Moscow a few years ago, uh, 2014, not coincidentally the same year as the invasion of Crimea, a statue of St. Vladimir. St. Vladimir is the Christianizer of the Kingdom of Rus. He accepted Christianity in 988-989. He was a king of the Kingdom of Rus, and he was uh, commemorated in a big statue erected in Moscow. Uh, the Ukrainians ran a, <laughs> a, a great political cartoon about this at the time. Um, they showed Ukrainian or they showed Muscovites walking by the statue when the statue wakes up. And the statue wakes up and looks around and says, where am I? Because mm -hmm. he doesn't know anything about Moscow. He's from Kiev, right? A far different place. And the Muscovites look up and say, who's that? Because <laughs> they don't know him either. Uh, and so it is an attempt to claim this historical past for themselves that is very, very present and being activated right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for for answering it that way. And and maybe this uh, leads us to this next question from Monica. Monica's in Brooklyn. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit for you, Monica. My apologies. Uh, please drop something in the chat if I get it wrong. Um, so you've given a great example, this statue. Um, how do the normal people consider this history? And so Monica's question is really, you know, do do the, the average Russian or Ukrainian also value the history the way Putin seems to be? In other words, do people just walk past that statue and even know what it's referencing? Um, or is it just something that's being, being sort of force fed to them? Uh, the vast majority of the population of Russia are Russian Orthodox in religion, mm -hmm. and so they certainly know St. Vladimir as the Christianizer, um, and that's going to be a, a person that they know in that way. They're less interested in the historical context. The religious situation in Ukraine is slightly more complex, but they certainly recognize as well the origins that are shared. Now, Andy, can I type in the audience chat? Of course. Okay, so what you see there is you can see St. Vladimir is Russian, and then St. Volodymyr is Ukrainian. There, there are differing traditions that have grown up that are emblematic in terms of the, the names that are used for these. But there is a shared culture, and, and this is where Putin's ideas are actually um, – and this is so true with, with so many falsehoods, right? They start with a grain of truth. And in fact, it's a pretty thick grain in this case. There's a lot of shared culture and identity between Russians and Ukrainians. Where that goes askew is that doesn't mean Ukrainians want to be taken over violently by Russia. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. Um, next question is from David. David's in Austin, Texas. He's wondering if the eastern provinces of Ukraine included the original Rus kingdom. Yes, absolutely. And so if you look at this map right here that I, uh, is on the slide, um, you have the Dnieper River running down the middle of it. Um, and the eastern provinces would be at the end of Periaslavl, right? Um, that's where we're going to be talking about some of those eastern provinces. And then south of that, we're going to see intermittent control uh, on this map. You see Kipchaks, Kumans, or Polovsi. Those are nomadic steppe peoples. And so there's not always positive control in the 12th century by Rusians over that territory. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, this question is from Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is in Colorado, and he's wondering uh, if you can talk some about Crimea. That doesn't seem to be part of this so far. What about Crimea, and why do people keep claiming it? Good question, and it isn't part of the world that people are involved with right at this particular moment. Um, this map is slightly inadequate for our purposes. Um, if I can go back two maps, you can see Crimea there, uh, and you can see Kherson is on Crimea. Right, So this is a city that is going to be particularly important, um, and it's going to be important in the medieval period, and it's going to be important in the modern period. So there is not a widespread of any kind of colonization down there. There is a trading outpost, and that's about it. And it's initially a trading outpost of the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, that is um, engaged with Rus'. 
Great. One more question, and then we can move on to your second uh, major point. This question comes from Robert. Robert's also in Texas. And Robert asked if the Volhina avoid the Mongol invasion to any extent. Uh, no, um, they absolutely get taken over by the Mongols as well, but they are one of the groups that tries to resist the most. Um, we will see that as a staging ground for a guy named Daniil, um, and he is going to try and resist the Mongols uh, much more so than almost anybody else. The classic example is Alexander Nevsky. Um, Alexander Nevsky uh, is also a saint, actually, in the Russian Orthodox Church, um, but he decides to make peace with the Mongols, and he decides to fight the uh, Latin Crusaders coming from the West, which is a pretty fateful choice. Great. Well, uh, let's move forward to your next question, uh, your next point, I'm sorry. And again, I'll, I'll collect questions as they come in. Let's do it. We're going to jump ahead in time, which I hope doesn't bother anybody too terribly much. Um, but we're going to jump all the way to the 17th century. Um, and now we're going to look at the territory of modern day Ukraine being split between a new polity of Muscovy, which was the inheritor of that territory of Vladimir Suzdal that had been in the northeast of Rus. And Muscovy is going to extend its control down the Volga rivers and is pushing towards the Dnieper River, as you can see. The other major power here is another new one for us, and that's Poland-Lithuania, and a unity of those two countries that controls territory from, once again, the Baltic down to the Black Sea, and they control the majority of the western side of the Dnieper River, as well as some of the eastern side at different times. This division is going to become emblematic for how we think about Ukraine even to the present day. Ukrainians will talk about this in terms of orientation by the Dnieper. So if you imagine you're standing sky high, straddling the Dnieper River, and you're watching it flow to the south, that's the way to orient yourself. So the right bank of the Dnieper River is on your right. That would be the west. The left bank of the Dnieper River is on your left. That would be to the east. So it's opposite of what we would typically think of as um, geographically oriented towards the north. We're orienting towards the south. But right bank and left bank Ukraine is really common language that Ukrainians use and Russians use to talk about the territory. And as you can see articulated on the map here, left bank Ukraine is going to be a territory that has been occupied longer by Russians. It is where Russian, even to the present day, is much more commonly spoken. Right bank Ukraine, um, we're going to have more linguistic difference and more Ukrainian and Polonisms, uh, language elements that come from Polish because of its occupation by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So we get that division there between those two halves of Ukraine. This period is also the first time we ever see Ukraine appear as a name on a map. And Ukraine in Slavic means border. Um, once upon a time, uh, at 1991, we would all say the Ukraine. Um, and Ukrainians did not care for that, and so lobbied extensively for us to all change how we refer to them, just as Ukraine rather than as the Ukraine. So in the 17th century, we see the first map that has Ukraine on it. It's a map made in Poland, Lithuania, and it refers to the area of the Dnieper River Valley and specifically right bank Ukraine. Now, the important part of this moment in the 17th century is we're going to introduce the Zaporozhian Cossacks and a guy whose name I just love to say, Bogdan Khmelnytsky. And Bogdan Khmelnytsky is the hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossacks. And hetman is actually a word that comes in from the Polish for a military leader. And the Zaporozhian Cossacks have their base right on the middle Dnieper, right? So right on the river itself. And he is the head of the Cossack host, which is the name for a band of Cossacks. And you can see a picture of him right there. Handsome looking guy. And this is the territory of Ukraine. And you can see, um, again, lacking the cursor at the bottom of this marked out territory, Zaporozhia. And that's the territory that he rules. So Bogdan Khmelnytsky is the hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossacks. 
So Bogdan Khmelnytsky um, is going to be part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and he is unhappy with that. Uh, he believes that the Poles are taking away his right to worship freely and oppressing he and his Cossack brethren, which, if we just look at Cossack history, is not something that they'll stand for. So in 1648, Khmelnytsky leads a revolt against Poland. They initially win some victories against Poland in the first few years of the war. Uh, they also spend a good deal of time slaughtering uh, local Jews. The Jews were looked upon as outsiders and profiteers. At this time, uh, Jews were illegal in Russia, uh, but they still existed in Ukraine, and so there were largest communities there. Uh, and so it does not go well for the Jews in Ukraine. Eventually, Khmelnytsky's campaign falls on some rough times, and so he approaches Tsar Alexei of Mos uh, Moscow to help him. Alexei and his advisors were not ready for another war with Poland. They had fought one just a decade or so before, but they had regularly complained about the treatment of Orthodox subjects within the Polish list. Poland, Lithuania. And there were, in fact, many Orthodox subjects in Poland, Lithuania. And so here, having Khmelnytsky at their door asking for help, asking for support, they felt they could do nothing else but help. Before Alexei, the Tsar of Muscovy, agreed to do this, though, he called on a committee of the land, uh, Zemsky Sabor is the, the language in Russian. And he called not one of them, or not two of them, but three of them um, to ask the population, or at least their representatives, are we willing to go fight for this? And the people said, yes, we are willing to go fight for this. And so there was some popular representation and popular support for this war. Thus, in January of 1654, and this date is important, Khmelnytsky and Alexei sign an agreement known as the Treaty of Periaslavl. Now, the interpretation of the Treaty of Periaslavl is a problem, and it will continue to be a problem for quite some time, because what Bogdan Khmelnytsky understood he was agreeing to was he would get help from Russia to have the Cossacks regain their freedom from Poland-Lithuania. What Alexei understood was that he was now in control of Khmelnytsky and the Cossacks, and anything that they took, he, Alexei, would keep. As you can see, this is going to be a fraught interpretation. By October of 1654, Poland has declared war on Russia, and Russia immediately marches in and begins taking territory along the Dnieper River. The Cossacks are bolstered by this, and they're marauding throughout Poland-Lithuania, killing large numbers of Catholics and Jews. By 1659, though, Russia is on the losing end, and they're giving back much of the territory that they had conquered, really only hanging on because of uh, civil war that erupts within Poland. And in fact, um, other hetman of the Cossacks, uh, there are multiple at this time, are going to be defecting to the uh, Ottoman Empire down in the south. Now, this conflict is going to end in 1667 with something known as the Truce of Andrusovo. The Truce of Andrusovo allows Moscow to keep uh, the left bank of the Dnieper, and Alexei of Moscow is going to create a new title for himself. He calls himself Sovereign of All Great and Little and White Russia. This is the first time this title has been rolled out. Great Russia is Russia. Little Russia, they mean Ukraine. And White Russia is literally Belarus. The problem is he doesn't actually rule any of Belarus, and he only rules half of Ukraine. Nevertheless, he adopts this title for himself. Um, there's a whole academic discourse we could talk about here called claims making. Um, and then he is also going to create a government bureau of little Russian affairs to handle the piece of left bank Ukraine that he controls. Now, Khmelnytsky doesn't like this. His successors don't like this. And they are going to keep up a pretty continuous revolt. In fact, already in 1668, the year after the Treaty of the Truce of Andrusovo, uh, a hetman named Brukovetsky is going to team up with the Crimean Tatars to raid uh, Moscovite territory. 
right? So we're actually going to get, even that very next year, discontent with this treaty. So this all goes back to the 1654 interpretation or misinterpretation of the way that these two sides viewed this agreement. And so this is a pretty essential moment, and we're going to see 1654 resonate in two of our other moments as well. And, and uh, I know as Americans, we're really have it difficult to hold on to history that old, especially if there's not a little rhyming couplet about sailing the ocean blue or something. Uh, but 1654 is a date worth remembering. All right, so questions about this, our second historical point. Uh, first of all, I think uh, everybody in the audience would agree with me to say that you handled these really complicated names uh, well. You pronounced, you, you got them right out of your mouth in a way that was impressive. Um, I do this Kristen, really. <laughs> Kristen, uh, <laughs> you've shared some great maps. You've, uh, you've again, kind of referenced these difficult to speak words, these, this faraway place that, as, as you've sort of alluded to yourself, sometimes it's hard for, for American-centric minds to wrap their brain around. This question uh, uh, comes from Teresa in Southern California, and she's wondering if you can recommend any source collections or archives that uh, that that younger students can work with, where they don't have to worry about the language barrier. Are are there translations? Are there places to get the kinds of images or maps or sources that teachers can use that? That aren't sort of bound in this this language that you've uh, that you've been uh, using. Yeah, absolutely. There are resources. Um, I mean, it, it really, uh, you know, Teresa. If we could talk directly, I would be able to figure out exactly what it is you're looking for in terms of period and, and age group, and, and let you know. I apologize. Generically speaking, it's harder to do that. Um, I would start by looking at. Um, a, especially if you like maps like I do. Um, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute has a digital map project. Um, my dynastic marriage map, I showed you a couple slides ago as part of that. I will show uh, a map from it in a few minutes about the Holodomor, the famine of the 20th century. They have a lot of resources there. And there are a whole lot of translated sources from Russian history that you can access in English. Most of them are not in source books. Um, anymore, but there were certainly in the middle of the 20th century a lot of source books of this kind, uh, and you could find them um, at used bookstores. I, I'm always seeing copies of, of some of these uh, source books. Great. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Myla. It's a uh, pretty short question. Myla is in Seward, Alaska, and she wonders if, um, if you can clear up the pronunciations that we all hear in terms of pronouncing Kiev or Kiev. Which pronunciation should she use with her students? Right, and this is a big question. And in fact, I was talking about this with a, a member of the NHC here today. Um, so traditionally speaking, we as historians have talked about Kiev, K-I-E-V. Right? The Ukrainians have tried to encourage the pronunciation of Kiev, K-Y-I-V, um, and that has been very, or at least relatively rare, uh, until recent days. The explosion of speaking Kiev, and that's probably an inappropriate expression, I apologize. Um, the, uh, the importance of saying Kiev actually came to light during Trump's first impeachment, um, when, of course, it was about ties to uh, the Ukrainian president. And so we saw people like uh, Lieutenant Alexander, Vig uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vidman um, saying Kiev. We saw the ambassador saying Kiev. Either one is accurate. Um, Ukrainians today will often say that Kiev is a Russo-centric pronunciation. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Last question before we move on. This comes from Jesse. Jesse is in uh, southeastern North Carolina in uh, Lenore County and also, by the way, is a Wittenberg grad. Uh, Jesse is wondering if, if you can explain why his students still see the term White Russia on pre-World War II maps. Why, why is it continued to be called White Russia into the uh, 20th century? Uh, well, it, I mean, it is white Russia. Belarus is white. It's literally, that's what that means. That's what those words mean. Yellow Russia uh, is white Russia. Um, and so I suspect on some of those maps, it is just an instance of uh, pronunciation or um, of translation. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, why don't we move on? Why don't we move on, and then we'll take a break uh, momentarily for some more questions. Terrific. All right. So we're going to talk now about my third point, which takes us into the 18th century. So we're moving a little bit farther ahead. And I'm showing you a couple of maps, not just from the Russian perspective. We have a European-Russia map on the right, where you can see the Dnieper River in the boundary of Russia. We're not in Muscovy anymore by the 18th century. Stretching just beyond the Dnieper. And then you see over here on the left side of the slide, Poland, Lithuania, this massive polity that contains most of right bank Ukraine as well as modern day Belarus. And so those are the two main polities um, that are going to be vying over the territory we're talking about in the 18th century. And in the 18th century, we're going to move into the time of Peter the Great. And Peter the Great is best known for reaching out to the West, for creating St. Petersburg, and for creating the Russian Navy. Uh, he was especially involved in something called the Great Northern War with the Swedish King Charles XII. But this war also involved Poland, Lithuania, and our Ukrainian Cossacks as well. This war is declared in 1700 and lasts off and on, mostly on, until 1721 when Peter is victorious and he gains some Swedish possessions. Peter controlled, as you can see on the map, left bank Ukraine, but not most of the right bank. And even the Zaporozhian Cossacks, that same Cossack group from Bogdan Khmelnytsky's time, who were ostensibly on his side, really weren't. The main actor in this drama is Ivan Mazeppa, and Mazeppa is the hetman uh, of the left bank Cossacks. Now, you might think of the hetman of the Cossacks as riding a horse, spitting a lot, and killing people with a sword. Well, potentially Mazeppa does this, but he's also a major landowner, a patron of the arts. Uh, in fact, the Kiev Mohila Academy, today one of the premier universities in Ukraine, uh, certainly at least before the war, a place where I have had many colleagues, um, was endowed by him, um, causing it to grow immensely in the 18th century. So Mazepa is a very powerful figure in Ukrainian history. In 1702, Mazepa secured permission from Peter the Great to assist the right bank Cossacks who were revolting against Poland. So again, we're calling back to the same idea of Khmelnytsky. Things come to a head, though, in 1708, when Peter is expecting a massive attack from Charles XII. Because of the size of the projected assault, Peter wanted all of his troops available to him, including Mazeppa and his Cossacks. So he pulled them out of the Dnieper Basin, thinking that Charles was going to come directly from Moscow. The absence of Mazeppa and his forces from the Dnieper Basin allowed the Polish king, a guy named Stanislaus Leczynski, I would love to say there's going to be a quiz on these names, but I know I can't do that. Um, Stanislaw Slachinsky, an ally of Charles XII, invaded that territory. Now, Mazeppa claims that this is a violation of, you guessed it, the Treaty of Pereyaslavl from 1654, when he says the Russians agreed to help defend the Hetmanate from its Polish enemies. So Mazeppa is calling back to this treaty from the time of Khmelnytsky 60 years earlier and saying that the Russians have violated it, and so he is going to defect. Right? He is going to leave because he believes that treaty has been broken. And he takes 3,000 of his Cossacks, and he goes over to the side of the Poles and the Swedes. Uh, Peter is going to view this, of course, as traitorous behavior. And Peter had centralized the power of the Russian state to a degree that had not yet been seen in Russian history. And one of the things that he had centralized was the church. He had made the, the Russian Orthodox Church an arm of his government. And so because Peter viewed this as a, a traitorous act, the church did as well. And they declared Mazeppa anathema outside the balance of the church, and his soldiers could be, and were, killed in an incredibly brutal manner. Peter is going to appoint a new hetman, uh, Ivan Skoropadsky, who does remain loyal, and we're going to see more bureaucracy for the little Russian government, as the Russians will call it. 
Mazeppa and his forces fought in the famous Battle of Poltava on June 27, 1709, and this is a painting of that battle. Peter's army was numerically superior. Charles was wounded, um, and Peter actually just had a better strategy. The remnant of the Swedish army, uh, the remnant with uh, Mazeppa, is going to flee into Ottoman Turkish territory. Peter is going to solidify his gains, taking more territory on the Baltic. And a big takeaway from this is that it's going to make Peter a player on the European international political scene. The Europeans in the West were astounded at the power shown by Peter's victory over the Swedes, and many were now worried about the potential of a threat from Russia, something they had never considered before. This is worth noting and pointing out because this is the first time we begin to see the Russians as a uh, boogeyman character in European ideology. I show you here a quote from an official of King George I of England. Germany and the entire North have never been in such grave peril as now because the Russians should be feared more than the Turks and are gradually advancing closer and closer to our lives. Right? The Russians are compared to the Ottoman Turks, Muslims, right? who were often portrayed before this time as the great boogeymen of Christian Europe, uh, used to mobilize Christian forces against the Muslim enemy. But now the Russians are placed in that same camp. So if we're looking for some of the roots of the otherness of Russia, of Europeans versus Russia, right? here's a nice little moment in which we're seeing in the early 18th century those two sides being oppositional already. And, and that wasn't Peter's wish. Peter was very much a Westernizer, and a, a, actually a Westernophile uh, in many ways, and a Europhile. Coming back to our character of Mazeppa, his legacy is mixed. In the 18th and 19th century, his name is used as a generic uh, curse for Ukrainian nationalists. Russians would refer to anybody who talked about Ukrainian nationalism as a Mazeppa or a Mazeppaite in our, in our uh, terminology. He's still excommunicated by the Russian Orthodox Church. But even in the 19th century, there are those who idolized him. Uh, Mikhail Pagodin, a famous Russian scholar, wrote in 1822 that, quote, the little Russians call themselves the true Russians, and the others Moscali. They do not entirely like them. Muscovy was something apart. They love Mazeppa, end quote. In modern Ukraine, the Ten Krivna note has his picture on it. There are schools named after Mazeppa. There are streets named after Mazeppa. And his legacy is one of an early Ukrainian nationalist. While in modern Russia, he's still viewed as a traitor to the state. And the main divide? Well, the main divide goes back to the interpretation of the 1654 Periaslav Agreement. Did the Hetman become subordinate to the Tsar forever? Or was he just seeking and receiving aid in that one particular instance? So as you can see, right, with this third historical point, we're building a picture of moments of interaction between Russia and Ukraine historically and moments of fissure, right, where, where there, there are these breaks. And if after this, if you haven't already, if you after this you go back and you read Putin's On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, you will see each of these moments that we've talked about. And you will see how he has twisted them to talk about the primacy of Russia and how Ukraine is nothing more than little Russia and belongs with Russia in a union. All right, so that's the end of my third historical point. Uh, we, let's pause here for some questions. Uh, Robert, again, Roberts in Texas is wondering if this is where de Tocqueville got his idea about future conflict between the U.S. and USSR. Um, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So that's coming from a little bit of a later time, and we've got more complexity to go. But um, I, I'm going to skip over a lot of that complexity. But there's a whole lot of really great stuff that happens in the 18th and in the early 19th century that is going to roll into what Alexis de Tocqueville is going to be thinking about. Um, and in, in, in general, he's going to be thinking about not Peter, but Catherine the Great. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to play a role there. Great. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from Jacob. Uh, Jacob is just outside of Chicago. 
Uh, he's wondering, uh, this is this question is not specifically to the content that you're talking about, but he's wondering how this content generally is addressed in education, uh, in curriculum, in schools. Uh, are students taught what you're sharing? No. Okay, I should talk more than that, Jacob. But no, <laughs> and that's one of the real problems is our curriculum um, is generally still designed to hit the high points of Western civilization. And so there is Greece, there is Rome, um, there are the Dark Ages, um, and then there's England that comes out of the Dark Ages, and then eventually we end up at America, the shining city on a hill, the fulfillment of the Athenian promise of democracy. And this is where behind me there's a little light glowing, and it goes, oh, right? And so that is a narrative that is going to be triumphalist. The rise of world history has shifted that narrative a little bit, but because of world history's worldness, you're going at it from 30,000 feet. And so you're not really looking at European history in this particular way. You're taking particular moments from all around the world. Moreover, to take this one step further, um, we don't tend to look at Russia as part of either European or uh, Asian history. So it gets its own camp. And so unless you're doing something related to that particular camp, you're not going to engage it. And Ukraine doesn't appear in anybody's history, although I imagine textbooks that are going to be written starting now are going to include it a lot more. That's a great answer. And I apologize. I think I, I didn't make the questions precise enough. I think Jacob was wondering if this is taught in Ukrainian or Russian schools and curriculum. Oh, a hundred percent. I apologize. Yeah. 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 No, I was thinking about American stuff. Oh, absolutely. Right. And and you know, one of the things that ever since I was going to Russia, starting in the, the 1990s, um, I found that they knew more history than almost any American. You'd get on a bus and they would find out you're an American, the bus driver, and he would launch into a, a comparative analysis of the French, American, and Russian revolutions. So yes, the the history teaching is uh, terrific in that regard, even if it's often by rote. Mm, great, thank you, um, Christian. One of the one of my roles as moderator is also to be timekeeper, and I need to remind us we have about twenty five minutes left. So why don't we move to your fourth point and uh, go down the story a little further? All right, we're crushing it on time though, Andy. We're doing great. Awesome. All right, so my fourth point is one that Putin did not talk about, nor would he talk about, and it relates to the Holodomor. But before we get to that, we need to develop um, our t passage of time from 1709 all the way to the 20th century. And this is a point at which Putin is particularly interested in. Um, the Russian Empire has fallen, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics has come into existence, and that process was messy for Ukraine. Right? Because initially, we're going to see that Ukraine is going to become um, briefly independent right? in uh, roughly 1917, right? um, although this territory is occupied mostly by uh, the, the Germans at that time. There will become a Rada. Uh, Rada is the uh, Ukrainian word for parliament uh, that is going to be created in Kiev. The first leader of this Rada was a guy named Mikhailo Khrushchevsky. Uh, Khrushchevsky is actually a historian who wrote a multi-volume series called The History of Ukraine Rus, which is actually still a terrific read for the history of medieval Rus. Um, there has been a new translation that's come out by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Um, so it's, I think, 13 volumes in English. But you don't have to go right out and buy it. But it, it is still actually a very good resource. And Khrushchevsky wanted to have an independent Ukraine after the fall of the Russian Empire and the fall of the provisional government. To fight this democratic organization, the Soviets created a capital of their own in Kharkov, in left bank Ukraine. Kharkov, Kharkiv, in modern day uh, Ukraine, is a city that was the functional capital for the original Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was from there that the Red Forces, the forces of the communists, expanded throughout Ukraine and took the majority of that country, uh, forcing the disbandment of the Rada, but also launching a war with a war with Poland. I apologize. Um, and what we're going to see then is the situation where, with that war, they 
Ukrainians will lose half of their country. Western Ukraine, actually Western Belarus as well, will be ceded to the Poles in the Treaty of Riga in 1921. Um, that is territory that will be lost to those two countries, those two Soviet socialist republics, until the time of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939 between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, when that territory will be, uh, quote-unquote, reclaimed right, for those two polities. But this independence movement and this idea or thirst for independence for Ukraine in 1917 um, is not going to end with the creation of the Ukrainian SSR, and the Soviet government in Moscow is going to take action against the Ukrainians in the early 1930s. Now, in 1930, Stalin launched collectivization in the Soviet Union along with industrialization at about the same time. Collectivization was taking all of the private land that was owned, either by individuals or by communes, and making it into collective farms. That process was incredibly disruptive and violent. The people did not want to do this. It was an attempt to try and make the countryside into uh, factories, right? the farm into a factory. The goal was this would create more agricultural produce produce that could be used to feed the workers in the cities that were driving industrialization, but also produce that would be exported for hard currency, currency that could be poured back into the industrialization drive, thereby fulfilling both goals at the same time. The reality of the situation was that collectivization led to massive grain losses um, and eventually to famine. And there's a mass famine in 1932-33 that is directly connected to collectivization, although there are also environmental factors as part of it. Ukraine, then, as now, was the breadbasket of that region, and it had a bad time in the famine, but a bad time that was grievously exacerbated by the Soviet government. This is not just a time of famine. The Ukrainians call this time Holodomor, the starving time. And this is a time um, at which we will see mass famine, but also political consequences for the Ukrainians' desire for independence. In 1932, Stalin passed a decree called On the Procurement of Grain in Ukraine, the North Caucasus, and the Western Region. Uh, this was to increase grain procurement. Now, increasing the taking of grain in the midst of a famine, right? the purpose of the increased grain procurement was not to feed the rest of the Soviet Union, but to maintain the grain exports of the Soviet Union, which were providing hard currency, currency which, as I noted, was fueling the industrialization of the Soviet Union. Now, if it was just about grain, that would be one thing, but the decree is not. It also ordered the arrest of saboteurs in those areas. Fourteen individuals are named explicitly. All of them are Ukrainian. Culture was attacked in this decree as well. Ukrainian was directed to be removed as the language of correspondence and instruction, and it was to be replaced by Russian. Ukrainian quote-unquote nationalists were to be sought out, punished, and imprisoned. There is also a correlation in this decree between nationalists and foreign agents, uh, a correlation that we will see later in the 1930s in the Great Purges, that if you're a nationalist, it must be because you are a spy from the West who's trying to undermine the Soviet Union. It wasn't enough to take the grain. It was not enough to attack the culture and those individuals. The Soviet government also erected barriers physical blockades to prevent aid from going into Ukrainian towns and villages, all the while taking grain from those same places by force. Now, this was not the first famine in the Soviet Union, but it was categorically different. In 1921, there was a famine in the Soviet Union in which millions of people were dying and Lenin himself accepted aid from the United States, from the American Relief Administration. The American Relief Administration helped alleviate that famine. However, this time, no help was requested or desired. 
Four million people died in Ukraine during the famine. Over the entirety of the USSR, famine is going to kill between five to seven million people in those two years. The legacy of the Holodomor is immense. Ukrainians view this as a genocide, an attempt to kill off Ukrainians in general, and specifically those who desired independence, as well as Ukrainian culture, language, and history. The Russians, when discussing this event, minimize it. They talk about the climate conditions, and they note this affects a variety of places in the Soviet Union. It is not just about Ukraine. So was this a genocide? No, at least according to the United Nations definition of what a genocide is. But following Anne Applebaum in her book Red Famine, we can note that, in fact, the United Nations definition on genocide was co-written by the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union made sure to include language that focused on acts committed by the Nazis and not what they, the Soviet Union, did or were doing. However, if we look at the writing of Raphael Lemkin, the lawyer who initially started construction of the United Nations Convention on Genocide of 1948, he wrote an article in 1952 with the unambiguous title, quote, Soviet Genocide in Ukraine. So certainly we can see here the perspective that this was genocide from the author of the at least the initial draft of that proposal. I'm showing you here a map of the Holodomor from the Digital Atlas of Ukraine. And I mentioned this to you a little bit earlier in questions. The Digital Atlas of Ukraine is managed uh, by the Harvard Institute uh, for Ukrainian Studies, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, there we go. Um, and that is um, a website, the MAPA website, where you can find all kinds of information about this, not just maps, but images like the ones I had on the slide before, um, interviews, testimonials, uh, all kinds of things to discuss this. And this, um, and there are multiple other features of this MAPA project, are all freely available on the internet and are encouraged for classroom use. And so this is a resource that absolutely would be something that you could take advantage of. Now, the Holodomor is a defining moment in Ukrainian history, and it is absolutely not a moment that Vladimir Putin is interested in talking about. But this is a moment when the Ukrainians felt a sense of us versus them, and the them are the Russians. And this is one of the reasons why, on February 24th, when the Russian army marched in, even Russian speakers in left bank Ukraine didn't drop their weapons and become Russian because they have a sense of Ukrainian identity that is separate from linguistic identity. Now, the fact that Zelensky is in fact also uh, a Russian speaker, right, apart from the fact that he's Jewish, his first language is Russian, right, he's able to shift between Russian and Ukrainian when he talks to his people and when he talks to the Russians. Language is not necessarily a marker of identity in that same way. Shared experience, shared history, shared culture, and events like the Holodomor are defining for what it means to be Ukrainian, especially in the 20th and 21st century. So that's my fourth historical point. Questions? Thank you, Professor. We do have some questions that have come in. Uh, while I'm sort of collecting them and organizing them, Natalie has asked that you drop the uh, website in the audience chat that you've mentioned. Uh, the archive would be great. Yes, there for the MAPA, for the MAPA yeah. project? Uh-huh. It looks like Judy uh, just added something in there as well. Okay. Got a couple questions for you. Um, the first one, well, I got to tell you, Grace, you've got three great questions here. Grace is at the University of South Florida, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna tick through three questions. The first one I think is gonna be pretty direct, and the second two are gonna be a little bit more involved. So let's do the first one first. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Grace asks. Um, 
Professor, you talked about how Europe suddenly became very aware of Peter's Russia and its power as its land grew. How was Ukraine, right bank Ukraine, viewed by Europe? Was it lumped in with Russia at this time, or was it considered to be separate? Uh, well, this time is the key indicator there. So it's it's totally separate during the 18th century with Peter because it's part of Poland-Lithuania. Um, but then it would become increasingly part of that territory over time. But even during, as I was saying, um, the period 19. 19- 21 to 1939, um, parts of Ukraine are still part of Poland, right? So this is also a country that has been divided the way that Poland was divided in the early modern and and, um, parts of the modern period. Thank you. And now, Grace, has several other questions I'm going to offer to you together as a a twofer. Uh, First, was there pro-USSR propaganda circulated by Ukraine, I'm sorry, in Ukraine by the USSR in the early 19th century? And was there any significant support of the USSR control by Ukrainians? Yes. Um, Yes, on on both counts. Well, in the early 20th century, yes. Um, And so one of the interesting things that drove the creation of the Soviet Union was an anti-Russian feeling. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, under Alexander III, Tsar Alexander III, and Tsar Nicholas II, the Russian Empire... Um, became a Russifying force. So they tried to make everybody in their empire Russian. And the people that this alienated most were the ethnic minorities in the empire who were not Russian. So Ukrainians would be a very big group there. And so you find those ethnic minorities who are non-Russians participating in greater numbers in rebellious movements, such as the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, uh, et cetera. And so Ukrainians played a big role, actually, in the revolution. And then they played a role in managing the Soviet Union as well. And in fact, multiple premiers um, had Ukrainian roots, either for their personal uh, roots or through their uh, parents. Great. And now, last question from Grace. Uh, Was any Ukrainian material culture attacked by the USSR in addition to the attacks against language and other cultural identity? Um, Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, um, One of the things that Stalin in particular did was he wanted to destroy churches and mosques as symbols of religion. Um, And so, you know, thousands of churches throughout the Soviet Union were bombed and destroyed. And this Mm -hmm. is true in Ukraine as well. Um, We also saw a mass uh, stripping of all of the provinces of their history, and that history was centralized in either St. Petersburg slash Leningrad or in Moscow. So, for instance, when I was in graduate school and I wanted to access materials relating to the medieval history of of Ukraine or of of Rus, let's say, um, all of that's in Moscow. It's not in Kiev. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Great. Uh, you should come take a Russian history class at Wittenberg. <laughs> uh, this question comes from Judy. Judy is in Boston, and she asks whether or not anyone has called Putin out publicly on his misinterpretation of this aspect of history. Uh, that's a good question. Um, Zelensky has numerous times um, tried to to offer that. <laughs> Um, but whether or not Putin is listening at all, I, I would guess no. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, that has been offered to him. I don't know, for instance, in um, the the meeting that Macron had with him, for instance, that the French readout characterized as a history lesson, if Macron offered anything uh, opposite of this. But I, I kind of doubt it because, you know, there have been a few times, when was it, 2017, uh, when Putin went to France, and he talked about the historic ties between France and Rus. He, in fact, invoked Anna Yaroslavna, the princess I talked about, who became the French queen and regent, as a tie between Russia, uh, in his language, uh, and France. So that's you know giving France a medieval history coterminous with itself, and then co-opting the history of Rus for Russia. Great. One more question before we uh, move to your fifth and final point tonight. Um, This question comes from Carol. Carol's in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, Maybe a longer and more difficult question, but here it is. How different is the Ukrainian language from Russian? Um, Yes, so that's a really interesting question. Um, So when I lived in Russia, when I was in college, my host parents, who I, I really, I'm telling you the truth, were named Boris and Natasha. 
Um, my host parents would tell me that I would always speak like Ukrainian because I would um, sh -sh -sh, um, which was a, a very Ukrainian sound to their ear. Um, but Ukrainian is actually related to Russian in the way that Portuguese is related to Spanish, which doesn't help. I know if you don't know Portuguese or Spanish, um, but it's a language that you can read if you know one or the other of those, but the speaking is quite different or it's becoming more different. Uh, and in fact, since 1991, the Ukrainians have taken pains to make their language different than Russian. They've absorbed more Polonisms, um, and they've tried to shift it. The same thing has gone on in the former Yugoslavia, where we see Serbia, Croatia, creating very different languages for themselves. Um, but in Ukraine today, a Russian speaker can read Ukrainian by and large, even if hearing Ukrainian would be a little bit off, like there would be something not quite right there, um, and you'd have to adjust your listening to, to hear what was going on a little bit. But, but even Ukrainians I know who are uh, in their 40s and 50s, um, when they are expatriates, right? Uh, when they speak to 20-something graduate students in Ukraine today, um, even they struggle a little bit with the shift in language since 1991. Great. Well, Christian, we have about uh, a little over 10 minutes left. So let's move through your last point, and then we'll take questions at the end. Terrific. All right. My last point brings us all the way to World War II. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, one of the most curious claims and maybe one of the most interesting made by Vladimir Putin. And that is that he was engaged in the denazification of Ukraine. In fact, he just repeated this today in a speech. The idea that Ukraine is run by Nazis or Nazi elements or fascists dates, as one would imagine, back to World War II. In the 1920s and 1930s, there were fascist groups operating in almost every country in Europe, as well as in the United States. Uh, apart from the National Socialists in Germany, the Italian fascists, there were the Iron Guard in Romania, the Arab Cross Party in Hungary, um, and on Ukrainian territory, both of that within the Soviet Union and the Western peace that was in Poland, this fascist movement took the form of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. The OUN has split multiple times, but it's continued to exist. Now, after the Nazi-Soviet invasion of Poland, resulting from the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939, the OUN collaborated with the Nazis. They were particularly interested in undermining the Soviet Union with the goal of creating an independent Ukraine. Once Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, the OUN declared an independent Ukraine with a capital in Lviv, uh, subordinate to the Nazis. Hitler was not interested in the independent Ukraine. The Gestapo arrested the most belligerent OUN members, in particular the leader of the most nationalist fashion, Stepan Bandera, who is pictured there. Bandera was sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp, where he was held until 1944. Uh, his brothers ended up in Auschwitz, where they died. Now, not initially anti-Semitic, the UPA did, uh, the OUN did end up participating with the SS and killing thousands of Jews on Ukrainian territory. They killed even more Poles, tens of thousands, mostly women and children because it was wartime, to remove them what, from what they viewed as Ukrainian territory. Um, 1944, Bandera is let out of Sachsenhausen and returned to Ukraine by the Nazis as they are losing the war to start operations against the Soviet Union, which he did, and which continued after the final settlement of war in Europe. The OUN, through a group called the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, killed Poles, Russians, Jews, most anyone who wasn't Ukrainian, um, in a mission to create a Ukrainian state that was independent of anyone else. Now, in the immediate post-World War II period, it has been alleged that both the British and American intelligence organizations helped to support Bandera and the UPA against the Soviet Union. And eventually, Bandera was assassinated by the Soviets in exile in the 1950s. I've included here, in addition to a picture of Bandera, um, this a leaflet for the OUN. It says, Slava Ukraina, Geroyam Slava. Um, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. And I included this because not only is this apropos to our topic, but this is a phrase that I and maybe you are hearing all the time now Slava Ukraina, right? Glory to Ukraine. 
Um, and it doesn't implicitly make one a member of the OUN, but if you are uh, someone like Vladimir Putin who has a historical and conspiratorial mindset and you have people saying Slava Ukraina and you've got this as your model, well, maybe all those people fighting for Ukraine are in fact members of the OUN. And that's one of the problems with looking at history, uh, pardon me, looking at modern politics through a historical lens. If you know enough history, you can often find comparisons. If you don't know enough history, you always go back to World War II and call everyone a Nazi, right? But there are other examples that you can dig into, and Slava Ukraina is one that I think Putin is seizing on as well as his people. Now, the legacy of OUN is immense. In fact, in post-1991 Ukraine, the OUN became a, a political party. It played a small role in elections, um, in fact, getting less than 1% of the vote, um, as recently though as 2018, far less than what we see, for instance, for the AFD in Germany. But this becomes even more complicated when we get into um, uh, the time of Viktor Yushchenko in the first decade of the 20th century. Viktor Yushchenko, as president of the Ukraine, gave Stepan Bandera the title of the Hero of Ukraine an honorary award that was created in 1998. Now, giving Bandera the Hero of UK, Ukraine Award caused a huge backlash among Poles, Russians, and Jewish groups, as well as among many Ukrainians. It was revoked by the next president, Viktor Yanukovych, but the damage had already been done. As you see in this slide, in fact, there are statues to Bandera. Um, in fact, there are two dozen statues to Bandera in Ukraine. There are streets named after him and so forth. So Bandera is still an incredibly powerful, mobilizing figure in Ukraine, even with the history that I was just telling you about. Now, if we go back to 2014, um, in 2014, there were the Maidan demonstrations that ousted his favored, Putin's favored candidate, Viktor Yanukovych, from the presidency. The rationale for the Maidan protest was Yanukovych's refusal to sign the EU association agreement to try and bring Europe uh, closer to Ukraine and vice versa. However, for Vladimir Putin, the Maidan was a moment that uh, the OUN, right, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, backed by American and British intelligence agencies, was able to overthrow the Ukrainian government and install their own own government in Ukraine. And so when Putin talks about denazifying Ukraine, what he means is to get rid of these forces that were put in, he believes, illegally in 2014, just like Bandera was backed by the American and British intelligence services in 1945 and 46. And just like Bandera was an OUN member and a fascist, these modern people must also be fascist and OUN members as well. So he, the tie here between Ukraine, fascists, and Americans is particularly clear, at least to Putin, in the story of Bandera and the OUN. Now that's my last historical point, but I do want to show you two more slides. The Guardian has a really interesting and scary slider of towns. And it has and allows you to see images, satellite imagery of Chernihiv, a city that has existed since the 11th century, right by the Dnieper River Valley, before the war, and then after the initial bombings. And this is outdated. I mean, this is from not that very long ago. Um, and yet already the bombing in Chernihiv has gotten much worse just in the last two days. So you can look at this on the Guardian website. Um, it's also free to use, and you can show various images in class to show the destruction that's been caused. Mm -hmm. Right. Questions? Thank you, Professor. And that was, uh, you've shared a lot with us tonight. We do have some questions that have queued up. Um, and again, I want to remind our audience that the readings and the resources you provided, as well as a, a recording of this, will allow everyone to go back and sort of linger over some of these points and spend time uh, fully understanding them. A um, couple of questions have, have come up. Uh, the first question is from uh, Judy. Judy is wondering if you can contextualize what happened in, I'm sorry, I just scrolled out of view, what happened in Catton within this narrative. And that was in the World War II section of your talk. <coughs> oh, gosh, I'm sorry, pardon me. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, this is a massacre 
of Polish uh, officers that was covered up by the Soviets. And in fact, the Nazis told the world about it, um, and the Soviets denied it vehemently all the way up until the 1980s. Um, but it's a really interesting moment in which the the Soviets and we have to be careful not to connect the Soviets and the Russians as a one-to-one -one comparison, but the Soviets killed these Polish army officers um, as part of that invasion of Poland. Um, and in fact, you know, even though we do have to be careful about a one-to-one -one relationship, the Polish-Russian relationship going back hundreds of years is incredibly fraught. Um, and initially in the 1930s, when Stalin was looking to uh, create alliances against Nazi Germany in something called um, uh, a collective front uh, agreement. Um, the the one he could get was in Central Europe, um, but it was on the other side of Poland. And he asked Poland if he could station troops in Poland, and Poland said no. I mean, I think probably what they said privately was, "Are you out of your mind?" But um, no, he wouldn't. They wouldn't let Stalin station forces in Poland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There, there's a lot of curiosity about this this use and and intentional uh, misuse of information, historical interpretation. Uh, this question comes from Anne Marie, who's in Lafayette, and she wonders if Putin is using this historical backfilling, this this misinformation that you mentioned. Is he using it to convince the people of Ukraine and Russia of his uh, intent, or is he using it to uh, for others in the West and, and other parts of the world? Um, yeah, so I don't think he's using it. I think he believes it. And mm -hmm. I don't think he actually cares what anybody else thinks about this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things about being in his position is you don't have a constituency that you need to worry about. There's no polling. Um, and so he believes this, and he's going to make it happen. Um, one of the really hard parts about judging Vladimir Putin in the current context post-COVID or the late COVID, um, is that he doesn't see people anymore, uh, by and large. Uh, the table, the very long table that I had in my first slide uh, is there for a good reason. He's incredibly scared of COVID. Um, people isolate uh, for a week before they can see him. They have to go through this uh, misting um, disinfectant uh, to get to him. I mean, he doesn't actually interact with very many people anymore. So because he really does think this way, and he really did think that, that in fact, Russians were going to march into Ukraine and the Ukrainians would say, oh, thank goodness, I've wanted to be Russian all along. This Ukrainian thing was just a sham. Um, and, and he believes that, and so he acts on it. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that it is not our historical reality or the Ukrainians' historical reality actually bears no relation to his actions. Great, thank you. Uh, two more questions. The uh, next question from the audience comes from Robert, Robert's in Durham, North Carolina. And he wonders um, how you might suggest that educators like those in the audience tonight, uh, how they might do a better job of countering Putin's cherry picking of history as you've done tonight by presenting broader and more accurate contexts. I think that's exactly what you need to do, Robert. I think that we need to talk about history in a longer durée. I think we need to integrate other areas into our history so we understand the interactions of what's going on. Um, you know, one of the um, things that Vietnam era studies, for instance, is, has done in the early 21st century and the late 20th century was talk about all of the Chinese context over the last thousand years in Southeast Asia that was missed um, in the 1960s and 70s by American planners who were not in Interested. They were interested in the French Indochina, and they were focused on colonialism, right? They didn't look at that larger history. So I think if we can put um, these events into context, it helps us understand them better. The other thing I would recommend is try looking at them from the different perspectives. Uh, students in my Russian history classes often have uh, written in comments that, uh, that I loved Russia. <laughs> um, and it's not, I don't particularly love Russia. When I'm teaching Russian history, I try and give the Russian perspective on things as opposed to the American perspective on things. For instance, World War II, which is a fraught subject uh, for American students when looking at it from the Russian perspective. So I, I think these are two ways that one can try and counter that misinformation and inculcate a uh, love of history for history's sake in students. Great. Last question, Christian. Um, in all seriousness, Christian, are you optimistic? 
in life or about this situation? <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm generally not an optimist, and um, I don't think this is going to end without Ukraine ceding territory. I do not mm -hmm. believe that this will lead to a wider war. Um, I really don't. Putin's aims are to rebuild the periphery of the uh, Russian Empire or the Soviet state. He calls the Soviet collapse the greatest uh, mistake in modern history or the greatest disaster, pardon me, in modern history. Um, he has already gone to war in Georgia, and the, the West did nothing. He took Crimea, and the West functionally did nothing. He thought the West would do nothing this time, um, and he's particularly surprised that this has happened. But already there are these frozen conflict zones in these other places, like Transdenistria, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, as well as uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia uh, with Georgia. And these are areas that the EU and NATO are not a part of. Um, and so we will see continued Russian aggression in Ukraine until peace can be made or until uh, the Russians have taken the whole territory. Mm -hmm. But I do not believe they will move on other places that are NATO. Um, Moldova um, is, is maybe worried. Um, Georgia is worried. I know the Baltics are worried, but I really do think actually that NATO would, would step in there. And I'm not sure that that's in Putin's uh, view right now. Professor, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your insights. Um, we look forward to, uh, to seeing how this plays out with the guidance that you've shared tonight. Thank you, Christian. I'll see you at lunch tomorrow. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. I want to thank everybody in our audience tonight for joining us at, uh, for tonight's pop-up webinar. Please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds, especially our Twitter feed, for upcoming opportunities and uh, activities that we'll do uh, for humanities educators. That does include our next webinar scheduled for March the 22nd. I'll be joined by Scott Saul, Professor of English at UC Berkeley. Scott will be uh, working with us uh, with a very provocative title, what can Richard Pryor and Archie Bunker teach us about teaching offensive language? Uh, have a great day at school uh, tomorrow, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for this, uh, this special episode, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Good night.